Hello, everybody, and uh, thank you for joining us. This is Alexandra with PCS Adventures. We're very excited to have you with us today for our Ready, Set, Drone webinar. We are broadcasting from Boise, Idaho at Garfield Elementary, and we have Michelle Fisher and Sonia Galavis here to talk about um, mini drones and how to incorporate them into a classroom. And um, with that, I'll turn it over to Michelle, and we will get started. Awesome. Thanks, Allie. So I'm Michelle and I'm here with PCS Adventures and we're joined by Sonia Galavis. Um, we're going to be going through today what are mini drones and then Sonia who piloted our Ready, Set, Drone curriculum here at Garfield is going to share her top five tips for sure. anyone that wants to start using mini drones in an elementary school camp, classroom, any sort of setting. Um, at the end we'll go over the camp that we offer and then have time at the end like Allie mentioned for a Q&A. Um, so just to fill you in a little more, we are really excited to have partnered with Sonia. She's a 15-year teacher that's nationally recognized um, and also teaches fifth grade here. So thank you so much, Sonia. Oh, yeah, happy to be here. <laughs> and then I'm our director of STEM development at PCS Adventures. We're also here in Boise, and so we partnered to develop this curriculum together. And so if you've been reading our blog series, you've probably seen a bunch about mini drones. Um, and so as you go forward, we just want to introduce a little bit what are mini drones and why are so many educators using them? Um, so mini drones, unlike other drones, are really small. And so this is one here that Sony used with her students. And so if you've used any other kind of drones, you know that one of the challenges is often finding a space to fly. Right. And so if you're like us here in Idaho, a lot of the times a year flying outside isn't an option. And so with mini drones, you can fly no matter what weather, as long as you have a gymnasium or some kind of big space where you can get around and show your drones. Um, another thing with mini drones is that they're obviously a lot safer. This one doesn't have prop guards on, but if it does have to go through the smack in the face test, it'll probably pass. And so, especially with younger students, you can have a lot fewer anxieties around the safety concerns. Um, and so another thing with the mini drones is with big drones, there are a lot of regulatory issues, which as there should be with bigger drones, there's more concerns. And so with mini drones, you don't have to worry so much about registering with the FAA, mm -hmm. notifying the airport, going through a lot of these steps. So it simplifies the prep mm -hmm. a lot if you're just jumping in and want to get started. So with that, if we can switch to the next slide um, to show our first tip from Sonia. Sonia went through this with her students. And so yeah. I'd love, Sonia, if you could share just a little bit um, about what you went through with your students and what that experience was like for them. Sure. So um, I think a huge part of going through this was, for me, uh, I felt a, a little apprehensive um, and I love PCS Adventures, and I, but I didn't have an extensive knowledge with drones and I thought like, oh, I, I've flown one for fun with my kid, you know, at home, that's something that, you know, he got for Christmas one year. I'm not familiar with all the parts and how to do it. And so I didn't know if I needed to have an extensive background in drones mm -hmm. um, or be uh, fully versed to be able to explain everything about how to do it. Um, but I realized um, you didn't need to really. Um, it was something to where, you know, I had to suspend, you know, my own disbelief of whether I could do it and really recognize and admit with the kids, we're going to be learning this together. Um, and that became a really rich experience for the kids and I is that we are partnering together to figure this out. And we were able to troubleshoot and um, really talk through a lot of the challenges as a group. And it was really fun. And I learned alongside with them, which is a fun experience as a teacher. Yeah. Were your students a little surprised to learn that you didn't know everything about drones? Yeah, I think they, you know, because I love science so much and I'm the STEM coordinator for the building, I think they sometimes think I know everything about all things science and yeah. and maybe I bluff a little and you know make them think I do but no I admit it I said I, I don't know this we're gonna learn this together um, but we have a community of learners and so they were excited they're like great you know we'll, we'll show you how Miss G was you know yeah. we'll show you how to do it and it's because um, uh, a lot of it is intuitive we were able to troubleshoot together and really they were showing me and 
I do a little more of the reading. It was a good, it was a good balance. Yeah. And that's probably a cool experience for them too, to yeah. realize, you know, that they sometimes are the more knowledgeable Absolutely. ones. Absolutely. And some were coming with more knowledge because they had, they had a drone that they got for whatever birthday or whatever holiday, um, or had, you know, experience outside of school. And so we already had experts in, in the room, you know, what we would call it, who had um, more experience. And so we highlighted those kids um, and just really were a community when, you know, playing with the drone. So it was great. Yeah, no, that's really cool. One thing that was really important to us in designing a curriculum was knowing that a lot of people out there really want to get into drones, but it has to work without you investing all of this time up front to get really good. And so one of the things in the curriculum, there are a bunch of short videos Mm -hmm. um, that help introduce some of those concepts. So if you could share a little bit, Sonia, about how you integrated those. Sure, so the videos were really helpful because we were able to watch them together as a class and you have a, a bunch of options. I chose to watch them together as a class because I didn't have the experience with the drone. So I wanted to make sure we were all on the same page. So we, you know, I posted them in my Google Classroom and kids could watch them and they did watch them again, but we watched them whole group and were able to discuss what was she saying in the video? You know, what did we take away from it? Take some notes, use our STEM, um, you know, notebook with it. And so the videos were very helpful. So not only were they directly instrumental and um, instructing on certain parts of the drone, uh, the, the video um, was able to show footage of what that looked like. And then there were applications outside of the, the mini drone into the larger gl- global and world context of drones. So it was really good connections for kids. Um, also, I have... Uh, a lot of English language learner, learners in my class. And so that video, um, the visual reinforcement for drones, that was really important for them to connect vocabulary to um, an actual concept, to seeing it work in real life. Totally. Mm. And we'll talk more in depth about what's covered in the curriculum later. Um, Sonia was doing this with a classroom full of students. Yeah. Some people are doing it in an after school or a camp setting. Um, But could you speak a little bit, Sonia? I mean, you have so many things to teach during the day about why you wanted to include drones. Really, I mean, the drones was an opportunity to have integrated STEM. And so, I mean, for elementary school teachers and teachers everywhere, we we don't teach in compartments anymore. I don't have time to say, oh, this is just specifically a science block or a math block and be able to get to all of it. So this was an opportunity to where we could have uh, math and engineering discussions and science and real world application and writing and reading um, and assessment all all in one. So I felt it was really worth our time to invest. um, And it was such high engagement and so fun for the kids. It didn't it, the time zipped by. And so it was it was a lot of fun. Um, and we were able to explore together and do small groups and have whole class discussions and have, you know, individual kids go back to the videos. So it really, there were lots of layers and points of accessibility for the kids. It was worth the time. That's great. I was mm-hmm. just going to ask, what did your kids think of the whole experience? Loved it. Oh my gosh. They were sad to see the drones, you know, have to go. We did it right before our winter break. Um, and it was, it was a high point for them. Everyone was able to be successful, myself included. And, um, <laughs> and, and it was a lot of fun. We looked forward to it every day that we were able to work on it. Yeah. And the product that we've put together comes with 12 one hour lessons. So mm-hmm. when so you went through, that was kind of the amount of time that we were working with. Um, and we'll talk more to you about what are some ways that you can extend. So whether you only have 12 hours, or you have an entire semester, kind of you can go as deep as you want to with the time that you have. So I know your second tip here, Sonia, was number one, you don't have to know everything. Yes. And then number two, the next one was take some time to build some background ahead of time. Right. And so for me, the school that I teach in, I teach in, in a low income community. So uh, a lot of the kids, the majority, I'd say 90 percent had had zero experience with drones. They didn't they've never flown one even for fun someplace else. Um, uh, they don't often get to go to science camps in the summer because of cost. Uh, so we were coming to it with limited background knowledge but myself included. So that it put us all on sort of an equal learning, you know, uh, a playing field. So we wanted to make sure that 
we were able to front load what we needed to know uh, before we started actually manipulating the drone and trying to fly it. So that was really important. That was a big um, key point for me. So we talked about like the purpose of drones and how do we think that it worked. And we really explored um, the drone itself and kind of took apart what we could and what do we think the point of this is. And a lot of uh, writing and reflecting and drawing, uh, making connections. And even though they hadn't had firsthand experience with drones, um, they, they knew what they were. They knew they've, you know, seen them in movies. They've seen them, you know, around even in our community and, you know, knew that sometimes they're used for weather, you know, or the firefighters would use them. So we tried to build a lot of that context for um, why do they exist? What can we learn from them? How do we think they work based on other engineering things that we've done this year? Um, so that really helped not only my English language learners, but kids who really needed to build the context before we were able to fly. Totally. So that helped. What do you think was one of the most surprising things for them as you were going through that? Um, for them, I think they were surprised at how fast they picked it up. They, some were a little intimidated and they thought, well, if I don't know anything about it, I'm not going to be successful. And often with my students um, in this age group, they take to electronics and they take to STEM concepts like ducks to water, I say. So they were um, being successful uh, the first, you know, the first time out or our first hour when we actually got to fly the drone. So I think that was surprising. It was probably harder for me because I, you know, I took the controls so seriously, um, but they had um, a great time. And when they had those points of success, they just wanted to do more and learn more and were even more excited for the next lesson. So it was great. Yeah, no, it's totally addicting. You know, you can absolutely see why so many people become obsessed. <laughs> absolutely, with this. yeah, absolutely. Um, the next one here, I know you mentioned, um, is to also incorporate the science notebooks. Right. And I know you mentioned this. Could you share some of the ways that you did that with your students? Sure. Um, for uh, for my students, and in you know when I've you know done science lessons with other groups, we really want them practicing and behaving like a scientist, like an engineer. They need to be recording their thoughts, um, taking some initial data. I, when we were doing the front-loading component and um, trying to build that background, we did a lot of sketches of what we saw, making connections to other things where we knew how they worked, kind of, you know, helicopters and blades and what, you know, what would those do and what purpose would they serve? Um, and really drawing evidence from, well, I think it works like this because I, you know, I have evidence or draw connections to something else. I know. So that context and having it written down becomes a reference and something to where they're teaching themselves and we're able to record um, sort of a trajectory of learning. And we would go back to the notebooks again. Well, what did we think initially what would happen and then what really did happen? And it was a really great reflection point for us as we were doing some of our, our first testing together as a class. What worked? What didn't work, and that was huge. That was a great discussion because I had a lot of what didn't, <laughs> what yeah. didn't work, and so we talk about okay, so what can we do differently? And when we fly mm -hmm. tomorrow, what do we want to make sure that we're doing? And even though when you're watching the videos and um, you know you see the safety regulations and things you should do, inevitably kids do just the opposite because mm -hmm. they're ten, and and so we talk about um, what do we you know a goal for ourselves and as a class, and so it just became this uh, a good. Tool to keep going back and reflecting throughout the process um, and they really like to see how they learned and were able to um, make better goals for themselves okay tomorrow I'm gonna you know be able to do this and this with the drone based on what I learned today so the notebooks are really important to sort of mark that yeah, no, that's got to be a really empowering process that you didn't figure it out for them. They no <laughs> figured it out themselves yeah. and that's then taught really me cool. yes yeah. yeah it was great. What were some of those things that you guys learned as a class as you went through? Yeah, you know, some of the, um, you know, so in the in the videos when it's talking about um, how the control works and, you know, really understanding uh, what the throttle does and how you even start to, to hover your drone. So that's, you know, your, your first goal. Can we get it? Can we lift it off the ground and hover? Um, inevitably, some kid opens up that throttle and it shoots yeah. across the room. And we yes. actually did the <laughs> crash test, you know, right into the face, uh, you know, a few times because, again, yeah. they're 10. You know, we had our safety goggles on and everybody was fine. And it was 
we were fine. But, uh, you know, kids will do anything that they can do, they are going to do. It's very Murphy's Law with elementary school. And so we would learn together, okay, so what did we learn by opening up the throttle full force, you know, the first time we turned it on. And um, and working in, you know, semi-confined spaces was, a you know, mm-hmm. uh, a, a learning experience for us because uh, even though I have a good sized classroom, I have 30 students and I had six drones in here, that's, that wasn't possible. And not every day it wasn't possible to go outside. We were doing this in December and it's cold. And so, and if there was, if it was wet, we weren't outside. So learning how to use the resources and the structure we had to make it work. So we were in the gym, um, learning how to work together. And always, anytime you have, um, a team building or you know a stem activity where it takes cooperative learning that you know that takes some troubleshooting how do we do this together how do we communicate yeah. with each other what i want to do or what i think is happening when you have a repair you know how yeah. do we work through that we had to learn a lot together about even repairing you know replacing um the you know the blade on it we would think we thought we knew what we were doing and we had to read and investigate. So it was a it was a good lesson for all of us to just stop and breathe for a second and then, you know, go over what we knew, um, you know, and look again at the instructions. And so it was great for the kids. It was that troubleshooting is always good. Yeah, to overcome that. You know, so often you yeah. run into a problem and it's, well, it's broken. Yeah. You know? Right. And yeah, we had to keep coming back to that. It's not broken. You know, what, you know, yeah. what happened? Did we have a, you know, a foot, you know, pop off or, um, and it was really rewarding as a teacher, as it always is, is when the kids take over teaching the other, their, mm. their peers, the, the other students. Yeah. And so they were relying on me less and less, but saying, you know, like, oh, you know, so-and-so knew how to do that. Go to him, go to her. And so that was great. They were really helping each other. Yeah. They're becoming the experts. Totally. Did you see students take on different roles as they went through it, the different things they became good at? Yeah, absolutely. So when, um, you know, for example, the hover, if someone figured out how to do that well, Mm -hmm. then they immediately wanted to show others how to do it because we didn't just want, you know, the Wild West and the gym Mm -hmm. where they were doing whatever they wanted whenever. We were really, you know, setting goals and challenges for each other of, you know, let's try a hover, hover, let's try forward, you know, four meters, um, whatever it was. And so they became experts and some were better than others on being gentle with the controls or some were better at maneuvering, you know, detailed. Uh, so they were helping each other. And it was really beautiful to see my um, refugee children and my language learners who may have had limited academic language to be able to apply what was going on, yeah. um, but really be successful and take to it and be able to share with their peers, um, whether that was in Arabic or Swahili, you know, yeah. um, and really get excited. Anytime I see kids um, engaged and happy and excited with a science concept, I'm over the moon. And that's when I get to step back and kind of let the magic happen. So it was fun. That's really cool. Yeah. Could you talk a little bit more about the space that you would recommend for right. anyone who wants to do this with six drones in the air at sure. one time? Ideally, you're outside. I mean, um, that's that's the ideal scenario because you're not worried about hitting walls and hitting roofs because that's that's going to happen. Um, when we were able to be out in the field, uh, you know, behind our school here at Garfield, um, we had a lot less issues of crashing and things breaking you know you know props the propellers breaking off just because they had the space and it was landing in grass um but like i said we had um you know rain one day and we moved it into the the gym but we made that work i think uh one thing that we figured out together was when you pair your drone um, by bluetooth from the drone to the actual um the the remote if the drones are too close together it's going to cross pair and they're not going to you know be able to talk to each other but the kids figured that out so they you know they take off down the hall pair you know the drone and then come back and they were able to fly it and we just had to use when we had to be inside we just changed our goals for the day instead of seeing like how fly how high and how far we could fly, they were working on um, tighter maneuverability. Mm -hmm. They had set up some little obstacle courses for each other. You know, we took our brick lab, um, you know, kits down there and they built, you know, little mini archways that the drones had to fly through or landing pads to see if they could land on in a certain space. Um, And that was totally worth it because we, 
yeah, that helped us flying outside, you know, the, the following day when we could go when the, when the weather was better. So in the classroom, when we first were building that background and um, trying to build context for the drone, we did do some hover um, challenges here because the goal was that it's just going to come three inches off the desk. And so yeah. we were able to do that. So I really maximized the space that I had here. So classroom, some hallway, um, gymnasium when it wasn't mm -hmm. occupied, and then outside. So use, use what you can and when it's available, but just make it work. I think it works. Absolutely. And this one came absolutely from your advice for your students, but to support with visuals and that building the background phase. Right. Because some of it is um, so completely out of context. Can I use this? Can yeah, I pick absolutely. this up? So, um, you know, when we knew that this was the control we were going to be using for the drones, um, to, to some kids, this may as well be, you know, some some foreign device. Uh, they, they knew that the controls, instinctually, that the controls were going to do something. But when we started watching the videos and learning about um, which is throttle, what's pitch, what's yaw, like how do you roll? Um, there's nothing marked on here. And so I have English language learners, kiddos that, you know, have some different struggles. Um, so I think a, a big takeaway for me, um, if I were to do everything over again, I would probably have some anchor charts around the classroom, really highlighting what it is that the control does. Um, and also on the drone, why, um, I mean, I think we covered in a video Video and and briefly talked about that they're different colors for a reason though but now going back I'm like I would have anchor charts with visuals of what it is labeled um, diagrammed and probably have those you know in their stem their lab notebooks again so when we're trying to learn how to control we know what we're doing a lot of with kids is um, trial and error and right. we saw that a lot and I think that was a takeaway for me that really have those visuals to support what it is um, you you know, and uh, proper, properly labeled diagrams to help all of us know what we're touching. And we were lucky enough to hear that from Sonia ahead of time, so then to be able to create some of the things. So Thank that, you. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, you didn't have when you were going through, right. but that was super helpful for us right. to realize, yeah, this is a bunch of information, and if right. you can have a visual, that's super helpful. Mm -hmm. So the one that you can see there is one that's included in the camp, and then there's oh, cool. another one with the different propellers, um, with the different colors and the different types of how does all that go together Awesome to help with the troubleshooting. Okay. And then I love this last one here to plan ahead for troubleshooting. So I know you talked on pairing the drone to the radio, right. the props. For someone who's just jumping into this, kind of what should they be prepared for? Um, yeah, so pairing, you know, would be huge because it is, and the batteries, my goodness, like I didn't, and Michelle had told me, you know, the batteries, you're going to burn through the batteries really quickly. So making sure that everything's charged, um, I would say troubleshooting of having your, you know, backup batteries that are charged and ready mm -hmm. to go because of just how much energy it takes. And those little lithium batteries um, don't hold a huge amount of charge. So that's something. Be ready for that. Um, be ready for the propellers to come flying off and that there is a difference between, and I'll use this, you know, the diagram that was shown, there is a difference between the A and the B propeller. They actually rotate in different directions and a drone won't fly if they put the wrong prop yeah. on the front or the back of the drone. And that was something because I had 30 kids um, diving into it, they were changing the props on their own and we're thinking, okay, why, does, why doesn't it fly right now? And so yeah. that was something that was huge to us where we, when we figured it out, we felt very successful <laughs> we, um, that we figured it out. Um, also, uh, your space, be able to troubleshoot your space. Um, they're going to crash into walls. They're going to, someone is going to open up that throttle and hit the ceiling and it's going to come crashing back down. Um, and, you know, just general, you know, educator tips of being able to troubleshoot frustration with kids when it's not working the way that they want it to. And so just being able to troubleshoot how, how the kids visualize the problem too. I think I really, in my own reflection, I saw it one way or maybe I saw what was what was the issue, but being able to walk through troubleshooting techniques with the kids to make, to empower them that they can do this. They can solve the problem using what we know, using the STEM lab books, mm -hmm. using each other, you know, who is an expert in one area. And so, um, you know, those are some of the things to be prepared for that to happen and kind of Murphy's Law with kids. Um, you know, and uh, but front loading as much as you can. And if you can 
talk to them that these are potentially things that could go wrong um, and just having a good attitude, I think, you know, yeah. just everybody relaxing, like, this is fun. Yeah. It's, a, you know, we're okay. Nothing's broken. You know, um, they're strong. The drones are really strong. Yeah. You know, when I watch it drop <laughs> 20 feet, you know, my heart yeah. stopped a little bit. But uh, the kids the kids did most of it and really empowering them that they can lead themselves through this experience as well. Yeah. And that's got to be almost survival for you. You know, there's only one of you and 30 yeah. of them, you couldn't be there for all of them if you wanted to. Correct. Yeah, I did do this. This was on on my own. Um, so, but it but it worked. And so the only way that it works is when kids step up and become the experts and become the you know co teachers and co learners mm -hmm. with me. Um, and they were more than happy to do so. So this was something they were um, highly motivated to um, participate in and help each other. So we were all successful. It was really um, all hands on deck for it. it was great. What about one concern I hear from a lot of teachers is, you know, there's one of me and 30 of them and we only have six drones, you know, so what does that mean for all of us that aren't flying at the time? You know, I'm sure some of it is just chaos and you embrace that, but how did you kind of right. manage that? So you lean, you lean into the chaos yeah. a little bit just because it is going to get a little wild, but um, you know, my room is set up in teams anyway. I'm a big proponent of cooperative learning. So I had six drones and so I just had six teams of kids. I have 30 kids. So I had five in a group and um, when one was working on, you know, if a hover or learning how to control throttle, they always had a partner with them. So they were like thinking through and talking aloud, you know, how they were working the control, um, something that might, might have been going wrong. So they always had a buddy. So that's two. Other kids were using our the Brick Lab um, to be able to maybe design a little challenge, a little obstacle course or a landing pad. Another one might, because I was requiring reflections and data collection they were working in their stem labs you know um, sometimes they were just spectators watching it happened and yeah. no nobody was off task you know with that so mm -hmm. they had options of things that they could be doing if they weren't hands on the controls um, and it seemed to work out and you know you'd see them troubleshooting with another team uh, so with five in a group and six drones it, it totally it totally worked that was possible that's really cool, especially because I know from having learned how to fly, sometimes you learn a lot just from watching somebody else. Absolutely. And it's kind of nice when the spotlight isn't on you yes. instead of partnering yeah. up. I think it's huge. It was good. That's really helpful. So for our next part here, we've been talking a lot about all these resources that Sonia used as she went through. And so what we do have available now is kind of the final version based on all of the oh, feedback good. from Sonia and her students. So if you want to use the same materials that we use, this is what's available in what's called the Ready, Set, Drone package. And so your class is fifth grade. Yep. And so we recommend for fourth through six. Mm -hmm. um, could you speak a little bit, Sonia, what would you say to someone who says, what about, you know, I have seventh graders or third graders? How far would it stretch in either direction? Absolutely. And I mean, so as you know, STEM coordinator for the building and as for fifth grade, I mean, and educators in general, we're always borrowing, stealing, adapting, you know, from multiple grade levels to make it work for us. Um, the drones are, I mean, it was tricky and because I was coming uh, at it from a very steep learning curve, I didn't know. Um, I could see as young as third grade being successful, especially if they had if they had some context and had some background mm -hmm. with drones or if you had a lot more volunteers and hands. So, mm -hmm. you know, third grade, they're eight years old, um, depending on what their background is with it. Um, I think a lot more is possible with as young as third grade if you have more volunteers really, you know, really troubleshooting. Um, I, I can't imagine much younger, you know, much younger than yeah. that. Now, as far as older kids on um, this could this could go through high school, you know, I mean, truly, it, when you're thinking about the potential of drones, not only um, building obstacles, but then the research involved in it. And I think my my educator hat comes on where I'm thinking, oh, my gosh, the integrated unit that's possible of researching how it's used currently, um, you know, what the regulations are, local endeavors with it. Um, you know, if I had, had more time, I think, you know, bringing in uh, local connections and speakers yeah. who are using drones, sort of cutting edge technology with drones, learning, you know, uh, the coding and the design behind it, what do other drones look like? I mean, it could be as big or as, you know, small and manageable as you want, but I definitely see other grade levels, higher grade levels, having just as much of an enriching experience as we did and probably being able to go, um, a, you know, a little deeper with um, the technology mm -hmm. behind it. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. 
Um, as you're jumping in there, the drones themselves are also totally versatile through all the different grade levels. And so as we are choosing one, these come with what's mini quadcopters. Mm -hmm. um, it's just based on the size, but our number one priority was something that was really easy to fly. And so whether you're in high school or in third grade, when you're starting, you're a beginner. And yes. so that learning curve is the same no matter how old you are. So right. we wanted something that was really mellow for a new pilot um, and really easy to fly. So something that had some sort of self-stabilizing that would kind of help you out as you were getting started. Right. So these are included in here. And then like Sonia was showing you earlier, they come with a radio controller that has a FPV monitor here. So these are set up to connect with the camera on the drone. And so your students have a chance to fly either just by looking at the drone or by using the first person view monitor. Right. And for your students, what did you see? Was it kind of a mix of what they were using? I think because it was so new to them, um, they very much loved that they could see themselves in yes. the camera. And I got, you know, lots of like the inside of their mouths. They thought yeah. that was hilarious, you know, um, which was neat. But a lot of them, they were, I think it was because it was new, they were fixated on the drone itself. So they didn't do a lot of the flying through mm -hmm. um, the first person monitor here. Um, and I wonder, a question for myself, and I wonder if we had spent more time outside and to where they were going higher and farther away, if they would have really relied on the monitor. But for the most part for us, it was they were watching the drone. Um, they didn't want to let it out of their out of their sight. But mm -hmm. I could see how with more time and obviously, you know, um, more practice and experience, they would learn to use the monitor as well. So. It was cool, just my kids wanted to watch their drone, so. Yeah. yeah, and you had 12 hours or so to spend with them as you went through? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, I mean, I, you could use twice that. This is what's great about it is it could be something you could seriously do all year long, absolutely, all year long. Yeah. Or if you only have the, you know, short amount of time or if you're doing it after school in a camp, it's just, it's doable. I felt like it was really scalable to what you needed it to be. Yeah. No, I've heard people say if you can get in 40 to 50 flights flying in first person view, mm -hmm. you really feel like you know what you're doing. Oh, okay. So it's not something that you're going to feel like after 10 flights, right. oh, I've got this, I'm right. bored, what right. am I going to do now? Um, but if you only have 12 hours, would you say like your students felt like they had at least gotten to experience a taste of that? Totally. As they yeah. were going through. Absolutely. And they definitely wanted, wanted more. So be prepared for that of where they're going. Yeah. They're going to want to keep flying and continue with the, with the drones, which is good. That's a good problem. Yeah. Have. That's right. a good place to end. Yeah. And I know you mentioned earlier that the batteries were something to be prepared for. Mm -hmm. So in the package, it includes all of the batteries that come for the radio that are rechargeable mm -hmm. and as well as additional batteries. So you can just constantly be recharging, knowing that you're going to be swapping mm -hmm. them out um, pretty consistently as you're going, because with that video monitor on there, it does drain them really fast. Right. And that's one one of the tasks we gave um, with each team. Each kid rotated every time we were, you know, um, exploring with the drones. It was somebody's job to go plug in all of the batteries at the end. Mm -hmm. And that was their task for the team. And that helped me because that's yes. a lot of batteries for, for, you know, for all the controllers and the drones. So the kids started taking responsibility because they knew if they didn't charge it, they wouldn't fly the next yes. time. So they took it seriously. <laughs> that was nice. Absolutely. Yeah. How many minutes were your students getting a flight time out of each battery, would you say? Oh, it went so fast. I'd say, I mean, an hour, I'd okay. say like, you know, it was because we'd go down for blocks of an hour and we were having to switch out maybe even sooner. The, you know, and there are plenty of lithium batteries in the pack. So I think most of them were going through two in that hour session and then we'd have to recharge these or we just did recharge those, uh, you know, every time, every time we, you know, flew. Yeah. It just became easier just to recharge everything when we were done. And just you know, mm -hmm. for sure. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And drones will typically come with one battery. And so if you only have the one, you're maybe going to get four to five minutes yeah. for that one battery is right. pretty common. And so, yeah, definitely having lots of extra batteries yeah. as well allows you to go for that full hour. Right. Otherwise, right. you're back charging. Yeah. And that could take up to an hour. Is that about what you It found? did. It took a while. And so we just after, you know, after we flew, like immediately we'd plug it in and would charge the rest of the, you know, that block of mm -hmm. time or until my lunch and, you know, I'd unplug them. So we just kind of got into a routine of how we would charge and just keep it charged and keep the extras handy. Because, yeah, now that I'm thinking about it, they did sw switch out the litho battery, battery at least once during that block of time. But once they knew how to, they just managed it. And so if you do yeah. 
do the back work that needs to be done. It's something that they can run it themselves. Yeah, and so. that's key. Then you're not taking all the batteries home to yeah. charge them every no. night. Nobody wants to no. do that. <laughs> no. So yeah, if you can get a simple system going with your students, yeah. that dramatically reduces that workload. Totally. Um, one other thing that's in there is a LiPo safe storage bag. LiPos are really easy to charge if you treat them safely. So something to include in there just as a safety precaution. And then the other things that are in there, you mentioned the propellers right. and just having a stockpile. Sometimes they will still be reusable after they've right. flown off, but sometimes right. they aren't. And that can be a good STEM experiment about what happened. But um, if you want to keep flying, you got to switch them out. Yep. So you definitely want to be prepared with lots of extra propellers. So we included just a whole bunch mm -hmm. in the kit so you don't have to worry about it. Um, the other thing that Sonia mentioned is the bricks. And so oh, nice. those are included in there for the obstacle construction. Oh, nice. And so you mentioned the launch pad. What mm -hmm. were some of the other things that your students made with those? Um, they made like an archway, you know, so the, the drone, that was an extreme challenge, right? Can the drone fly yeah. through it? And some of them just built like, you know, a pathway that the drone would have to follow, um, you know, or the elevated archway. And that was, that was kind of fun where they're off to the side, still engineering, still building while they were waiting for their turn with the drone. And they, that was a fun challenge for all of them to see if they could maneuver you know something that their team had built for them so it was fun yeah absolutely one thing we hear from a lot of people is saying okay i want at the end to put on a drone race oh. and so uh, one nice thing about being able to build your own obstacles is the race for your students after 12 hours maybe make it through one arch right you know or if you've had 50 hours oh my gosh you could go crazy build your own course make it as hard or right. as easy as your students are ready for right and in the videos, I know a couple of them showed like, um, you know, courses that the bigger drones and people who do it maybe yeah. competitively or, you know, in a more professional manner. So that was fun for them to see. And so they were able to replicate many versions of that. That was good. Yeah, absolutely. You mentioned the videos. And so to hit on the curriculum itself covers 12 one hour lessons. And mm -hmm. so those cover what we talked about with the building background, mm -hmm. you know, what are the parts of the drone? How does it work? What are the safety measures we need to know before we actually fly? Right. And then how do these controls work? So you're not having to just learn as right. you're there, although there'll always be a little bit of that. Right. And so these are gonna cover um, both the material in the print edition, but also the material in that video tutorial series. Awesome. So those are in there together. Um, it'll also hit some of the information about drones and ethics. So how do we use drones for good in the world? And then what are some of those real world applications mm -hmm. of drones um, that people are using in the real world? So a lot of students we see know of drones as a toy, but then also are aware that drones are being used, like you said, by right. firefighters and there are new things coming out all the time. Right. So that's gonna be covered in that curriculum. Depending on how much time you have, there are also a whole lot of ideas for extensions. I know you talked a little bit about some of the ideas, but if you had all the time in the world, what are some of the things you wish you could have done with your students? I think, it, you know, just the, the research behind it, you know, really looking at, um, you know, where do the first drones, where are they being used, you know, um, different capacities right now for drones, what's the future of drones entail. Um, and then I, I really believe in place-based education. And so mm -hmm. here in my local community, where, where are drones being used? Who is using them? Um, bringing in that guest speaker to build context that, oh, like this is a thing. People spend their whole lives doing this. Um, and really having kids as young as, you know, 10 years old, seeing that there um, mm -hmm. are STEM uh, uh, potential, you know, out there that this mm -hmm. is something that they could do for a career. This is something that um, they could uh, continue in high school um, as well. So I think just building our local connections around here, bringing more people in, giving them some chance to do research, and then the writing component with it. I mean, they did, uh, you know, quite a bit of writing in their um, STEM notebooks and their lab books, mm -hmm. but having them explore um, really a more uh, finished piece, you know, for me, again, that opportunity to integrate mm -hmm. the content areas and make it, um, you know, deeper meaning for the kids. So I definitely could have, you, you know, used more time. Yeah. I mean, if they have that more time, they will certainly get better at flying the drone. Mm -hmm. That's one thing. But some people say, you know, what, what is this beyond just a sport? And so that right. other piece of this is a real piece of technology in the world is really right. cool to see students realize that this can be a whole career pathway. This could be a real thing right. as you go forward. Absolutely. Absolutely. So for this final section, we want to open it up to any other questions that you have for me or for Sonia. And so I know you guys will be sending those over. 
um, based on what comes in. So keep those questions coming in. If we don't get to them um, in this session, we'll still be able to respond and answer to you. Um, you can either put them into that question panel while we're here live on the webinar, or if you have uh, questions afterwards, or just want to make sure that we get back to you if there's a little delay, you can send questions to sales at edventures.com. You can also reach us by phone at uh, 1-800-429-3110, and we can definitely help you out with any questions that we don't cover here. Um, one thing that I thought was a good question that came up is uh, about LiPo battery safety, mm -hmm. and what is included, like what are the things that somebody needs to know about that, and what in the package addresses that issue? Sure. So I'll let you go first, Sonia, as someone oh, who's gone through sure. the curriculum. Um, so the LiPo batteries being used for the mini drones are quite small. I mean, smaller than a little matchbook. Um, I know we don't have one in there. Uh, and, you know, as Michelle said, we it does come in a specific bag for that's LiPo battery mm -hmm. safe. There is um, a, a video dedicated to the LiPo batteries and what the potential, you know, harm is and also like what to look for, you know, if things are, you know, if the wires are starting to fray or if there's a puncture in it so the the students took it really seriously because they saw what you know worst case scenario in the videos and so they were examining their lipo batteries every time um, i had zero problems whatsoever but i also set up the expectation for how we're going to use the lipo batteries how we handle them how we store them how we you know charge them we don't leave it charging overnight i had zero problems you know that you know the only thing is i wish they had a, a 10 hour charge and instead of you know a one hour charge or whatever, but um, just really using the video, setting up expectation, letting them know there's nothing to be afraid of. And that was really a part of exploring the drone from the beginning, watching like, what is this thing? How do we connect it before they even got to fly it? So that they know the components of it and know the safety aspects. Mm -hmm. And I think you touched on all the important ones, as long as you don't leave it charging overnight, right. Right, you have your students aware of the warning signs. Is it puffy? Is it punctured? Right. Then you can notice anything before you even reach a chance that something could go wrong. Right. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, another question was about uh, regulations, and I know that comes up a lot with drones. Um, how does FPV and mini drones uh, are? What are the specific regulations, or you know, things that people would need to know for flying outside? Sure. So I can jump on this yeah. one. One thing that's about these mini drones that's nice starting with the FPV. So some radio transmission is regulated. So we made sure to include drones in the package that are FCC part 15 certified. So that would be one, you don't need any sort of special license to use the FPV capabilities of these drones. Mm -hmm. Um, another one is that because they're under 0.55 pounds, they don't need to be registered with the FAA, which would be another regulation if you were flying any other kind of drone outside in the airspace. Um, any drones that are flown outside, no matter how big they are, you would need to technically notify the air traffic control. And so some of the videos in Dronology do go through, you know, here's how to do that. Here's the radius if you're this close. And then here's the resources to find. Are there even air pads in your area that you may not even known about? Maybe they're at a hospital right. or something like that so that you can get connected with those. So I'd say those are the main ones. If you're inside, obviously you don't have to worry about it. Right. But being able to fly outside is really really nice and so you don't have to worry about your radio licensing mm -hmm. you don't have to worry about registration and then it's just notifying air traffic control if you are within five miles right awesome related to that if you're flying indoors i know you talked about this a little bit sonia do you think this is something that would work within a single classroom if that was the only space that was available inside one classroom i think you you could be sex, successful with some of the smaller tasks of it but if you're really going to experience the potential of of drone and what it can do to where yeah. the kids can have some room to make mistakes and have more than mm -hmm. more than one drone going at the same time you, you got to get outside or a huge space a you know a gymnasium type space so awesome um, and then we had a question about spare parts and i know that spare parts come in the package. Um, what did you break most often? Um, and did you feel like you had enough spare parts in that package to address those needs? So the, the props, the propellers, I mean, and Michelle had warned me, she's like, they're gonna, you know, fly off, don't panic. And so that that warning was really good. And so I, you know, told that to the kids. I'm like, 
they're going to fly off. It's going to be okay. And the first time it happened, you know, everyone's kind of stopped. Yeah. And yeah. because I'm like, it's fine. We know it's fine. And so we just um, replaced it. I think the only other thing that happened is sometimes like right here, mm. the, if it um, if there's a hard impact on landing, the, lo the foot of the drone will sort of pop off from the arm that connects to the mm -hmm. body. And, and again, Michelle had warned me. She's like, You're think you'll think it's broken, but it's not. It pops right back in, no problem. And that was the only thing that happened for us. So maybe the foot, you know, popped out and you can snap it back in place and then the, the props. So that was it for us. And my kids were tough on, <laughs> tough yeah. on the drone. So I did, I think you did touch on this about how many students did you work with at, at one time? How big was your classroom, your specific classroom that you worked with at? And I know you said you broke down into smaller groups. So I had 30. So third, you know, that's mm -hmm. a pretty typical classroom for my, you know, for my school yeah. in the upper grade. So I had 30 and I had six groups of, you know, five kids each and we made, and only me, and, only, and we made it, we made it work. And so, but that really is dependent on kids being leaders in the classroom. There's no way if I had to do all of it and had to do every troubleshooting and had to do every repair, I, I'd be pulling my hair out. So as yeah. the kids stepped <laughs> up, we just helped each other. We were a community. Yeah. Awesome. Well, cool. I think uh, really appreciate your time today, Sonia, sure. and your expertise in this area. And I also just wanted to point out that if you do have more specific questions about um, flight regulations or kind of the steps that you would need to take to get a drone program approved at your school, we've kind of encountered that multiple times with schools that we've worked with. So just reach out to us and we can help you um, navigate that a little bit. Um, so thank you for joining us today. And uh, we'll be following up with you. I'll go through any questions that I missed and make sure that we get followed up and um, that you have all your questions answered. Thank you.